Hi everyone, if you're new here to the channel, my name is Ovi, I'm a fourth year medical student and welcome to Ovi Man. Hi everyone, as the name of the video suggests, in this video I'm going to be talking to you about the most messed up things I've seen after spending one year in the hospital. Now mind you, there's a lot more messed up things that I've seen, but these are the five most like, uh, I guess, weird or shocking things that I would like to talk to you guys about. Quick disclaimer, if there's any of these topics that are a bit sensitive to you, like cardiac arrest, declaring a death, seizures, trauma, complication of a surgery with a lot of blood. Well, if you're sensitive to these topics, you might want to skip this video. If not, well, enjoy because these are the kind of stories I would hear from my friends or friends of friends of things that I've seen in med school. And now, of course, while respecting all confidentiality and things and patient identity and all that, I will be telling you about a few of these things that happened. So let's start with my very first case. And what I mean by very first case, I mean the very first thing or almost the first thing that I did in my, you know, clerkship rotations was declaring someone dead. And just bear in mind, okay, this is my very first rotation of medical school. It was in palliative care. It was the very, very first, like, you know, clinical setting, like full on, like, you know, hospital. My very first rotation. I think that all of you in med school will remember your first rotation and how it felt. But on my very first day, I had to declare someone Ted. Now, I had no idea how to do it. So I went on the internet and I just Googled how to pronounce or how to declare a dad. And there's a few things that go in the process. It's quite a complex process. Well, no, it's quite simple actually, but it takes like a few minutes. So it's not just like, oh, there's no pulse. Okay, well, and was a nurse with me. It was a bit stressful of an like, experience because I had no idea what to do. Um, I just, you know, I was reading, I was doing the things at the same time. Um, it was my first time seeing someone like dead. Uh, of course, like we had anatomy labs and we had, you know, bodies that were donated to the school and all that for our learning. But this was like, you know, an actual patient who was there in the palliative care unit. And yeah, what shocked me the most is that the patient was dead for about like, I don't know how long, but it, it wasn't that long. It was like a few minutes and already the skin was like pretty cold, um, colorless, like getting a bit, you know, bluish. And that's sign of hypoxia, of course, because you know, there's lack of oxygen. But yeah, it was really shocking to see like how fast, like, he, you know, the oxygen goes away and everything. So that was kind of shocking seeing the lack of response too. Um, and of course, then I went with the doctor to like, you know, speak with the family, the family knew what was happening. But still, like going in your first ever rotation and having that as an experience is kind of shocking. It was like, Holy crap, like this is starting like, you know, pretty strong. Um, and yeah, and luckily I didn't have to do it for the rest of my rotation. Um, all the other patients, you know, were, well, more or less stable, like, you know, palliative care patients. Um, but yeah, as a first day ever in hospital, let me tell you, it was kind of a shock. All right, so case number two of a messed up thing that I've seen. So this was in my emergency medicine rotation. And that was quite of a, quite a scary case because I had no idea what to do. Like I had no idea. So this was early in my third year where I had a, an ED rotation. And if you want to see the video about it, you can just click the link up here. So I was in a section of the ED where there's a phlebotomist that's there to take some bloods and all that. Um, and a patient was coming in to get some bloods. And while I was taking a history from the patient, was about to start to do a physical exam and I was just asking some more questions. And the patient stopped responding and the patient was looking at me and just stopped responding. I was like, oh, are you there? And then the patient started seizing. So they were on this um, little like bed type thing that was like lifted up that you couldn't put down. It was sort of a, you know, phlebotomy chair, you know, it's like a bit slanted, but you couldn't like put it all the way down. And then the patient started seizing right in front of me. I had no idea what to do. It was just there, take a history, quick physical, and then report that to like, you know, one of the ED consultants, ED attendings, whatever you want to call them, physicians. And so the patient started seizing. So I had no idea what to do. 
and you know there were convulsions and everything and muscle contractions and the patient was like you know falling over so you know i took the patient and i put them on their side you know laying on the on on the chair thing uh lounger type thing however you want to call it i had no idea what to do so i just like opened the the the, the door I was like hey, i need some help here uh someone seizing <laughs> like i just shouted that in the hallway because like i had no idea what to do at that point like i knew that Seizures, there's not a lot you can do specifically. You can give them like some benzodiazepines like lorazepam or midazolam, but that's usually IV. And of course I wasn't gonna do that because first of all, I can. Second of all, I didn't know for sure that that's what you need to do. But yeah, you would give some sort of benzo to like calm them down, uh, then put them on their side and just wait, of course, and then consult to like neuro or whatever. Um, I'm still not sure 100% what's the management of seizure patients, but, and I need to study that. But anyway, so I just opened the door, I shouted in the hallway, hey, I need some help here, someone's seizing. And like, oh my God, like a nurse came like running and then one of the residents came in and like the patient was still conscious. So there was no like loss of consciousness and the patient was just laying on their side. And I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, help me, help me, I don't know what to do. And the resident like came in and was like, yeah, don't worry. Like, you know, if there's not much you can do, you can just wait. And then the, the seizure resolved after, I'd say about like, I mean, for me, it felt like forever because I was there and I felt like powerless. I had no idea what to do, it was so scary, but it resolved in about like two minutes, more or less. But it really felt like it was going forever because I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so anyways, that was quite a, that was like a very scary experience. Like, you know, when you have no idea what to do and you're alone in a room with a patient and then something happens? Well, anyways, so yeah, that was one of the most like, you know, messed up things that happened or like shocking, scary things that happened to me this year. And uh, yeah. So moving to my next case and the next case is also in the ED. Um, it seems to be like a recurring theme seeing messed up things in the ED and I also made a whole video about this case which was a cardiac arrest in the ED so I won't spend too much time talking about it but basically what happened a short short summary is that I was in the ED and I was just observing there was not much going on and I heard over the intercom that there's like you know cardiac arrest ETA two minutes and then you know the doors open for the ambulance bay. There's like this paramedic doing chest compressions on top of the patient, like in the movies. They push them in into like the resuscitation bay. And then, you know, some doctors put in IV lines on both sides and there's someone doing chest compressions and everything. And what was messed up about that is that, but I mean, it wasn't messed up. It was just like my first time seeing a cardiac arrest. And I was really excited because I actually want to do ED and it's super interesting and all that. And I went to learn, but I was part of the team. I was with the resuscitation team and I was asked, I was next to do the chest compressions. So I was lined up, I was right there, I was the next one, and you had at least like five or six doctors all around me. So you had um, the airway doctor, you had the team leader at the end, you had a doctor doing the primary assessment, you had uh, like one or two, yeah, you had one resident doing IV lines, you had another doctor doing some more large bore IV lines, and you had like two other staff doctors, and I was there like ready to go when, you know, the, the person doing chest compressions was tired. And I was right there. Like I had put gloves on, I had put my apron, like I was ready. That's still in my head. I was just like singing, you know, like staying alive, staying alive, huh, huh, huh. Cause that's a rhythm, right? That you need to do chest compressions at. I was just there singing and I was like, holy crap, I'm next. Okay, I'm next. This is it. This is happening, Ovi. Like this is it, like this, like, it's a cardiac arrest, like you gotta do it, man. You know how to do chest compressions. You know, you gotta press like at least two inches. No, no, no. I was standing in my head, like singing the song, like staying alive, staying alive. And then the person changed. Well, like the, the retired, so I was going in. So like, you know, you tap on the shoulder, you're like, I'm here, like when you wanna switch. And then um, it was like the third round of CPR, I think. And then they were putting like, you know, the paddles and everything, analyzing the rhythm. And then the patient came back and I was there like, like I didn't, I didn't do any chest compressions, but like the adrenaline rush that I had, like, holy crap. I never had that like ever in my life. I mean, that intense of an adrenaline rush in such a short period of time. I mean, I was shook. Like I was right there and I was like, 
So do I do it? Do, do I not do it? Like I was seeing the rhythm, you know, on the ECG, which was like pretty much like, you know, messed up severe arrhythmias and all that. It was a patient um, who had a, an overdose in o, OD, you know, and with subsequent cardiac arrest. But I was there and I was like, like do, do I do just impressions? Do I not do them? Like, and I was right there, you know, like waiting in position. It was like, do I do them? Do I not do them? Like, blah, blah. And then like one of the doctors saw me and was like, hey, yeah, you're fine. Like, you know, you can back up and like, we're gonna, like, I think it was the primary assessment doctor was like, yeah, hey, you're good. Like, let me, let me assess, let me like auscultate the chest, you know? And I was like, but I'm ready. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you're good. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I'm good. Okay. And then I backed out and was like, you know, just watching the other doctors doing their thing. And yeah, that was just a, an experience that marked me. It wasn't messed up in any way, really. It was just like, wasn't shocking, wasn't scary either. It was just like really exciting. It was just like, like, yeah, like this is it. It's a moment that I'm gonna remember like for a very long time. So anyways, if you wanna hear more about the story, just like click here on the video and yeah, go watch that. Now, the next story, uh, I'm not gonna say what specialty it's from, um, but it was a surgery. And in the surgery, um, the surgeon had to remove a mass and the mass was, um, like encroaching on arteries, on nerves, on, it was through muscles. It was a really, really big mass that basically ate up like everything in that specific area. And during the procedure, there was a complication. So the surgeon that was operating, what happened is basically he tried to preserve the blood vessels, but you know, it's, you can't always preserve all the structures, sadly. Uh, especially with invasive tumors and one of the arteries was nicked so you know a little cut in the artery and i was there i was scrubbed in there was another resident besides me and there was the scrub and nurse so the nurse who gives out the equipment and all that and there was not a lot of other stuff you know because it was pretty like routine procedure and all that but the mass had expanded and got like you know more was more invasive, I guess, when you opened up the patient than was shown on the scans. And so that was a bit of a surprise, but you know, that's how it usually goes in oncology surgery. And so the artery was nicked and there was blood everywhere. I had never seen, and it was a, you know, a larger artery, I'm not gonna say where, but it was a larger artery um, about like, you know, maybe one centimeter in diameter, which is huge. It wasn't cut all the way across, but you know, just a little nick and you had blood like coming out of the artery like I've never seen before. But such pressure it was flying everywhere. Like the resident was like red, like the whole resident was red. I was right there besides, and I just took one of the, one of the gauzes was like trying to, you know, clear the field for the surgeon. And then the resident passed me. I wasn't doing much. I was just holding retractors, you know, and then uh, I told one of the nurses to like hold the retractors and then I took the gauze and the resident passed me the suction. So I was like, you know, putting gauze, throwing them away, more gauze, throwing them away. Cause I swear they were full with blood and under like two seconds, it was insane. Like, you know, the normal gauze pads are getting surgery as well. They were full, like so fast. And I was like suctioning and then you couldn't see anything. There was so much blood, it was insane. So they tried to repair it which wasn't successful. And then they had to eventually clamp the artery and then, you know, if, like go from there. But I had never seen so much blood. And like, you know, there was music and the OR and everything, you know, like like any OR, you know, it was pretty chill, pretty normal, normal, pretty like, you know, standard surgery. But yeah, when that happened, like, you know, music turned off and then the surgeon was like, get me some people in here. Like I need some help here. And then like another, like a vascular surgeon ended up coming in to like consult on the case, like in live. Like it was like, it was so intense. Like it, it's crazy how one fraction of a second things can go from, you know, smooth sailing to like, it was just insane to like chaos, organized chaos, of course, but there was blood everywhere. And at the rate that the patient was bleeding after two, three minutes, the patient could have been, you know, bloodless. They could have like lost all their blood. And yeah, you know, the anesthesiologist was like reading a book and whatnot, like everyone just jumped in right away. Like it was really impressive to see. 
and I was really happy to be like, you know, part of it to help a little bit. I, I didn't do anything. I didn't do much. I was just like, you know, suctioning all the blood and then, oh my God, the suctioning tube got clogged because, because of a blood clot down the line. And then it, we had to like replace the tube and everything. It was like quite an intense moment, quite a messed up moment actually, that I'm always gonna remember as well because it was just really intense. Like the whole vibe in the room went from like, you know, chilling, doing a routine procedure to like full on alert mode. Like this patient's gonna die if we don't do anything. Like it's gonna die now, you know? So yeah, that was quite, a, quite an intense experience. But in the end, everything was fine we would probably have had to remove the artery anyways and we did a a graft with like you know one of these like plastic tubes when it's not plastic it's a you know biopolymer and whatnot um but yeah just the experience of like seeing all that blood like i was like really like holy crap like what's going on you know because uh, you know it's kind of boring when you're holding the retractors and you're not doing anything sometimes you sort of like you know not lose interest in a surgery, but you know, you're just waiting around holding these retractors and then you get tired of it. And then you're like, you know, just waiting. Medical students will probably relate because that was a long surgery to get to the tumor. That was like, you know, a lot of dissection that needed to happen. It was, it ended up being like an eight hour long surgery. So, you know, it was, it was kind of long. I was hungry and all that. But like when that happened, I was like awake. I was like, holy crap, <laughs> like, you know, this is happening. Um, yeah, so that's one of the, you know, messed up things that happened this year. And now for the last case, that was a trauma case. So I was also on emergency. Um, this was at another hospital, which had a helipad to bring in big trauma cases. And one of the trauma cases was someone who fell from a three story high building onto like a, a, a metal cage type thing and they had like broken ribs they had of course like contusions all over their body they had severe back pain and leg pain so they were um lifted up by helicopter brought to the hospital where i was at and then in the ed you know um it, it was the whole like uh trauma acls that, that was happening so you had the team leader, you had, you know, circulation, you had primary assessment, you had all the other team members. And it was really cool to see because I did participate in SEMWARS, which is a national competition of emergency medicine. And you can see a video of it right here. I'm gonna post over the screen while I'm talking. Um, I also posted it on Instagram at ov.med. If you don't follow me on that, you should go and check it out. But it was really, really like a good experience. So I was aware of what was happening. I was aware of, you know, what was going on. This was later in my third year. And um, yeah, so I could see like everything that was going on. I, was, I could follow and everything. And basically the patient was fine. And it was so weird. Like the vitals were okay. There was no like fever. There was no like obvious like bleeding. Blood pressure was okay. Usually it's a bad sign when you see like tachycardia and low BP, low pressure. It's kind of a, it's kind of a like, you know, red flag. Cause then you get a heart that's trying to pump as hard as possible, but then the pressure is not high enough. That means that there's probably a leak somewhere or, you know, internal bleeding. So anyways, the patient was sent for a scan and then um, I came back a few moments later and then there was nothing, there was no internal bleeding. You know, the patient was kept under observation because, you know, for a repeat scan, it's not because there's nothing now that there's not gonna be something in like two, three hours, you know, and was put in, in under observation in the ED in, in zone one. If you don't know about the ED zones, I made a whole video about like explaining the zones and all that. Um, but yeah, that was like a really, really surprising, surprising case, surprising experience. Cause I was expecting like, you know, see blood, seeing like open fractures, seeing something falling from three stories high. Like, how are you fine? And falling onto a metal cage. Like, how are you fine? How, how do you have nothing after, after that? Like, it was just insane. Um, you know, must've been luck or something. I don't know. But that was kind of a, you know, memorable case that I had during my third year. So that's it then. That's the five most intense, most memorable cases that I've had in my third year. 
Now, if you didn't see my previous videos, I'm gonna link them up right here and you can click them to check them out. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you can follow me at ov.med. If you have any questions, you can send me a DM or comment them in the comments down below. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and see you in the next week's video.